Okay, welcome everybody. And uh, I am a research professor at the uh, Institute for Quantitative Healthcare, uh, Quantitative Healthcare Sciences and Engineering at uh, Michigan State. It's been a long road to get there. So I'm gonna give a overview uh, over what I do in my lab. So there are two main projects. One is uh, about cancer genetics, dealing with the question of how cancers escape from immune surveillance. And so I'll, I'll talk about the, the genetic screen we have for that using bioluminescently labeled tumor cells. And the second thing is also using bioluminescence imaging, looking at potential alternative uh, antibiotics from plants. Um, and then last but not least, but I don't have a slide on that, I'm working on a book on the war on cancer, reevaluating that um, to find a better way of dealing with cancer. I'd be happy to talk about it if anybody has questions. So let's get started with cancer. Some of you may be familiar with this, uh, uh, with these two publications by Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg. Uh, the Hallmarks of Cancer is one of the most, two of the most cited papers in cancer. And so what they pointed out in 20, uh, 2000 and uh, 2011 is that cancers have 10 characteristics, or they call them hallmarks, that um, they share across the 300 or so different types of cancer. And we don't have much time to go into the details, but there are independence from growth factors and resisting apoptosis and so on. Now there are two that we don't really fully understand well. For the for nine, uh, for eight of the ten, we know sort of some of the genetic drivers, but for um, the the escape from immune response, we don't really fully understand what genetic drivers can do that. The 10th one, tumor promoting inflammation, that's exogenous, of course, so that can be anything from physical agents to radiation to, uh, to chemicals and viruses and, and so on. So uh, I'm concerned here with the immune escape. Um, and so we know so far that, you know, cancers a complex uh, disease involving lots of genetic changes and about 140 genes that can drive the cancer in about uh, 12 or so signaling pathways. And over time, as you can see here on the left, in childhood cancers less so, but in adult cancers, they acquire quite a, quite a number of uh, mutations in many of these genes. There's a lot of genetic heterogeneity both between tumors, between patients, as well as within tumors. And that's part of the problem treating them. So what I'm interested in is what are the genes that are actually driving escape from the immune system surveillance. And so what I'm doing is I'm doing a gene transfer approach, just like it's been done for a lot of other of these phenotypes taking genes that have a track record of being immunomodulatory and cloning the cDNAs into a transposon vector for stable transfer into cells of interest. And then I inject those cells in a very simple model into syngenetic mice and then monitor the survival of the tumor by bioluminescence imaging, fantastic tool. Uh, to allow you to monitor pro uh, processes in real time uh, as they occur. And then I can then see how long these cells survive and hopefully recover them and uh, see which genes actually achieved a shift in phenotype. So here's a little bit more in detail. In this case, how I'm doing this. So I have these two transposons, one for the cDNA the other one with the transposase, which then inserts the transposon vector into the genome of the cells. And I can then either uh, sort cells or drug select them. And then uh, a million of those get injected into the mouse subcutaneously on the back. And we monitor the survival of, of the cells. 
So for the gene transfer, I have created a set of transposon vectors that allow you to clone the same cDNA um, using recombination cloning into the same multiple cloning site. Um, so I can multiplex, they had their two promoters uh, with varying strengths expressing the cDNAs. And then I have a, another vector um, that uh, allows us to label cells with uh, firefly luciferase for the bioluminescence imaging, as well as with a um, selectable marker fused to EGFP for fluorescence microscopy. So the first experiment, or actually not the first, but uh, the most recent and most complex experiment I've done is to take a murine fibrous sarcoma cell, and that is tumorigenic in not skid mice. So these are immunodeficient mice. And so it has all the attributes of a tumor a cell line, but it doesn't survive in the syngenic uh, black six mouse line. Um, so meaning they're not uh, rejected because of the, they can't grow, but because they have some uh, immune molecule that uh, stimulates immune response. And then in the black six mice, uh, these cells get eliminated. So I cloned nine of these um, genes so listed here on the left. These are sort of the usual suspects in cancer immune escape theory uh, as involved in, in the immune escape. I cloned them into the uh, two vectors um, and drug selected them and then expressed them in these cells and injected a million. Uh, and here's what we got. So if I just take a, a Neptune fluorescent protein as a negative control, you can see here, this is a, a graph of the uh, bioluminescence here that's log scale. And then over time, uh, you can see within about 20 days, the cells get eliminated. Um, but then none of these genes really make a difference. By 20 days, the cells are pretty much eliminated. There's some cells that hang on for a while. We don't know what that is, but they do get eliminated ultimately. So nobody rebounds here. So there's no escape in the end. So all of these genes, and then I subtracted, you know, one at a time thinking there might be a winning combination. None of these genes actually make a difference. Um, even the three oncogenes when overexpressed, MIC, uh, KRAS, and BCL2, uh, only have sort of an initial growth spurt, and then by 20 days, they're also eliminated. So that's what we've got so far. Um, the usual suspects of immune escape genes are not sufficient uh, for this cell to escape. Um, so then the question is, you know, there must be more genes or more combinations. Uh, we have now cloned something like 20 of these genes and uh, we're about to start one more time. But then the question is, is this actually complex enough? Um, so we're looking at some other possibilities, knockout transposons, and then the latest is um, using guide uh, RNA libraries with CRISPR-Cas9 for activation and repression. So that's the plan. So uh, the second thing I'm working on uh, with people in the lab is the question of antibiotic resistance. So the numbers have been increasing over the last six years. You can see here from the CDC report in 2019 is some 2.8 million Americans that are getting infected with antibiotic resistant bacteria and about 35,000 uh, have died, um, which is a, like a 50% increase over the last six years. So this problem is not going away, it's actually getting worse. Uh, we have lots of antibiotics, but they're losing their activity. The number of bacteria that the CDC lists as threats and the uh, number of, of people that are affected, as I said, are increasing over time. So it's a lot of uh, urgent need to address this question. So what I'm focusing on 
is um, gastrointestinal infections there are like uh, salmonella and e coli which are some of the most urgent threats that the cdc has identified so the situation is so bad now that we have now what's called pan drug resistant e coli um, that are literally resistant to everything that uh, is available as as approved uh, antibiotics now the question is is this uh, a surprise or not and is our current approach really the best one to to do this i mean we've been doing this for about 50 years and it uh, takes about 10 years or so after an antibiotic has been mass produced that there are resistant bacteria um, and then that spreads so it's about uh, five times 10 to the 30 bacteria in the world it's about 10 to the 12 species so it's a vast uh, DNA sequence space, and we can pretty much assume that resistance genes for all antibiotics that have been identified and we will identify in the future already exist. To make matters worse, some bacteria actually can use antibiotics as a source of carbon and nitrogen. So there's multiple pathways with which these bacteria actually all talk to each other and we can really view this also as one superorganism. And so if resistance is really only a matter of time and, and evolution. And uh, as David Livermore said, it's naive that we think we can win this war. Now, if bacteria are so powerful, then why does multicellular life actually exist and how does that manage? And so for, point, for about 1.6 billion years, We've had multicellular organisms, and I'm focusing on plants. And so it turns out that plants have, in fact, quite a number of antibacterial compounds. You can see here the late James Duke put together a wonderful database, huge amount of work. And so in the 13,000 plants that uh, have been analyzed partially or completely, uh, with 30,000 chemicals, 670 of those uh, have antibacterial activities. Um, so I started out in uh, quite a while ago looking at just essential oils that are extracts of certain plants uh, and looking at the antibacterial activity. So here is a list for what the USDA database has for um, three plant extracts, clove, oregano, and thyme. Uh, so these are all edibles um, and what um, plants use then is a spider web sort of a network pharmacology approach uh, that's complex and so a mutation or resistance gene against one compound doesn't really help the bacteria that much uh, keeps the fitness landscape sl uh, flat um, the chemicals that these um, plants produce that are antibacterial some of them are specific, some of them are, uh, they have in common, so there's some overlap. Uh, so this is the first experiment I did with uh, bioluminescently labeled E. coli in vitro. Uh, and you see within five minutes, you already have, um, sorry, I should explain here. So the three essential oils, and then in the 96 well plate, you have uh, just a treatment with mineral oil or nothing. And then um, dilutions with increasing concentration of, uh, essential oils of clove, oregano, and thyme. And you can see even within five minutes, there's already a, a reduction in the bioluminescence signal. Um, and then uh, it keeps uh, advancing. And after six hours, um, a lot of the um, uh, bacteria have actually died. Um, and then I switched over to a more, from a lab strain of E. coli over to a more clinically relevant salmonella uh, typhimurium uh, type. And so here uh, you see the same thing within five minutes already in effect. And then over time, uh, it's greatly reduced. This is the next day. So there is no rebound um, from the salmonella. Unlike with some of the uh, antibiotics, you may actually get a few uh, resistant mutants that rebound then. And then we plate those, the cells are actually dead. There's no um, sort of uh, persistence. So now we want to uh, screen essential oils and plant chemicals individually or in, in combination for activity against the variety of gastrointestinal pathogens. 
check for cytotoxicity, and then in the mouse model, actually prove that this can be used uh, safely as well as effectively, and uh, maybe also not only against gastrointestinal pathogens, but also against other really hard to treat uh, bacteria. So that's it what I have for today.